Karen Wright is one of the pioneers of the coaching profession and works with executives and entrepreneurs around the world to help them achieve the elusive combination of success, health, and happiness. Karen's company, Parachute Executive Coaching, was one of the first firms able to provide executive coaching on a global scale. She's a master certified coach through the ICF, which stands for the International Coaching Federation, and her most recent book, which she's here on the podcast today to speak about, The Accidental Alpha Woman, The Guide to Thriving When Life Feels Overwhelming, takes on the paradigm of the strong woman and shares stories and strategies from her own life, along with her clients and colleagues who have traveled a relatable road through overwhelm and into thriving. Welcome, everybody, to today's podcast I am so excited to introduce you to Karen Wright. She is an incredible woman and somebody that I really deeply admire. If you haven't heard of life coaching before, this is going to be a really great conversation to learn more about this practice. Coaching is on the rise these days. I think it's a growing profession and something that I highly, highly endorse and recommend. Now, I'm a little biased because I am a life coach, but I have found the practice of both being a coach and being on the client side, the receiving side of coaching, some of the most transformative work in my entire life. If you're unfamiliar, it's it's hard to put one label on coaching, but the lens I like to think about coaching is coaching is deepening awareness of who we are becoming as we're moving through our life and getting really a clearer view on what's most important to us, what's our life purpose, where are we really wanting to go and what are the goals and dreams we're holding for ourselves? And then it's also about accountability. It's having somebody on the other side of the conversation that's asking you powerful questions and challenging you and trying to move you forward in the direction that your heart is desiring. And it's just such a transformative practice. So Karen and I are going to, as they say, geek out today on some conversation about what it means to be a coach and what uh, that profession is all about. And we're also going to speak about her brand new book. And I have to say, just in the bit that I've read of her book, it's a really, really important read right now, especially in the time we're in where we are feeling like we have all the responsibility of the world on our shoulders. And how do we actually delegate some of that so that we're not burning out and getting stressed out? Karen's going to have some amazing advice for you on on how to navigate those crazy waters. (laughs) So um, before we get into the conversation with Karen... I also wanted to share with you guys some really exciting news that's uh, been taking place in my world. It's been such a creative time for me. I think because I'm not traveling as much due to the pandemic, as I'm recording this, we're still in the coronavirus pandemic. I've had more downtime at home, and I find when I slow down and I'm just in that more spacious place, I get more creative. I get these ideas that come through. And so over the last six, seven months, I've been really creative and have put together a few projects that I'm ready to share. I'm, I'm scared because it's right about to be put out there into the world, but I want you to be the first to know about it. I think it's a little scary to release creative projects into the world because I've been working on them, you know, as an island here in my basement and uh, I'm about to share it with you and I'm putting myself out there, which can be always a little bit edgy but awesome. So the first thing I want to tell you about is this new workshop that I've uh, recorded. It's just a short workshop. It's about 25 minutes, and it's a workshop on how to combat or how to conquer, you might say, stress and anxiety. Right now, we are probably at the most stressful time I've ever been on the planet. I mean, with the pandemic happening and all that's taking place, so many of us are just finding it so stressful and challenging. So I wanted to put together a short workshop to help you work through some of that stress. And I've put together just a really short three-part paradigm, so to speak, to help you unpack some of the stress you might be carrying and move into a more peaceful place. So that workshop is at my website, keithmcpherson.ca. It's free. You can sign up at any time. And uh, I'd love to hear how it goes for you. It's based on something called the three N's like the letter N. (laughs) In addition to that, another exciting project I've been working on that's about to be born into the world is a journal project, actually. I created um, a journal called My Conscious Life, a journal for intentional daily living. And this project came about several months ago, actually pre-pandemic, I started working on it. Uh, My friend Derek approached me 
And Derek had been to some of my talks and had read my mindfulness book. And he said, have you ever thought about putting together a journal project? And I said, I never have. He said, I said, tell me more. He said, well, I have this idea. You know, we've kind of lost the art of writing things down with pens and paper because so many of us now are on our digital devices. But he, um, we started talking and he reminded me of how important it is to actually start writing down what we're thinking about in our mind. It's, um, it's a powerful, cathartic process and something that I really endorse. So Derek and I have partnered up and created this journal project. And what it turned out to be was a three-month journal that takes you through the, a daily process of really creating and cultivating some new habits, um, really making sure that you're living the lifestyle that you're, you're desiring. And it's also a chance to really start identifying some of your intentions and goals in your life and holding yourself accountable to making it happen. I think so often we, we set up ideas and dreams and we have these big grandiose vision, visions in our mind, but we oftentimes don't know how to get there. So this journal project is a way to start living more intentionally, more consciously, and helping see your dreams and your visions into fruition. So I want to encourage you to check that out. It's on pre-order right now as I'm recording this. It might actually be out by the time this episode airs. Um, you can find the information at my website, keithmcpherson.ca, or you can also check it out. We've created a, a website for the journal called myconsciouscommunity.com. Now, speaking about community, I have another exciting project. I just I have to share this with you because I'm so excited. Um, I've created an online membership community as well. I want to really, this 2021 as we come into it, I really want to put out there uh, more inspiration and more ways for us to connect. Even though we can't necessarily meet in person right now because of the pandemic, I think that being online is this, the next best thing. And so I'm going to be putting together uh, in this conscious community um, opportunities for us to do some group coaching work together, um, some regular sharing daily. I'm going to bring some guests in as well that are going to share some wisdom and inspiration. And there's going to be a chance also for us as a community to connect with each other and to learn about each other. Um, over the time of my work as a coach and as a speaker and as a musician and a yoga instructor, there's so many things I do. Um, I just have found that there's this incredible community of people that surround me and I want you to meet them. They're just, they're amazing. And you are amazing, you that are listening. And uh, I just think it'd be so cool if we could get together more regularly and um, geek out with each other about how to live our best lives. So that's, uh, that's also happening now. You can go to my website under community to learn more about it. The actual community is called mymindfultribe.com. And uh, so that's also the website. Lots of stuff to share. Wow, <laughs> I could keep going, but I don't want to overwhelm you today. This is just like my big birth announcement of about all this creative stuff I've been creating. Anyways, with all of that being said, um, if you're brand new to this community, welcome as well. And uh, I want to introduce you to Karen Wright, who's here to share today about accountability, about coaching, about how to live our best life. So without further ado, please meet my friend, Karen Wright. All right. Karen Wright is right here with me. And I'm so excited, Karen, that you're able to join me for the podcast today. Thanks for being here. I'm really happy to be here. And there's going to be a little test later to see how many times you can say right. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and it's not even spelled like with the R, it's the W, but no, um, I know. it's perfect. Yeah, I'm so excited to, <laughs> to be sharing this time with you. I have learned a lot about you in the last little bit. And uh, wow, I'd love just for the listeners for you to take us back to the early days of coaching. <laughs> I mean, I understand that you were one of the first or the first to jump into this industry. So can we start yeah. there? I'd love to hear about that from you. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to say it was a wonderfully planned thing, but I, I had been working for Frito-Lay, which I loved. I was in marketing and they had moved me to Dallas, Texas. And um, the, the Dallas move was just, it was a disaster from the beginning. I think I had four bosses in eight months. You know, so there I was, I'd moved my whole life to, uh, to the US to, to follow the big career and it just didn't work out. And so after about eight or nine months, I just said, you know what, I think we're done here. And, uh, and I moved back to Toronto and there were some family things going on as well. And at that point I had this blank canvas where my career used to be 
So I had to decide, do I go find another marketing job? Do I do something different? You know, um, and I had loved the marketing job with Frito-Lay. It was, it was really, really a lot of fun. So I just didn't feel like I was going to be able to duplicate that again. And so I was really open to possibilities. And this thing called coaching started bubbling up. And uh, I had not, you know, invested a lot of time in understanding things like attraction and manifestation and all of that. Those were completely foreign to me at that point. But but when the same thing pops up three or four different times in the space of a couple of days from entirely random sources, it's hard not to pay attention, even when you don't really kind of know about any of that sort of thing. So, so I just decided that there was no downside in taking a training course. And I started taking a course and started talking about it. And as they say, the rest is history. Wow. So that was, that was a long, long time ago. Wow. That's incredible. I love how it just kind of like showed up a number of times till you finally jumped in it was really interesting it was and that was before you know google was really a thing and before we were as connected as we are now and so the ways it showed up i mean i was at a spa and there was a magazine in the waiting room and with a cover story about someone in coaching and you know so it was in (laughs) canadian business magazine i mean it was in some some um old school kind of places but but several mentions in a really concentrated period of time that's amazing. I'm curious, yeah. like, what initially, if, if you can remember back to then, like, what was it about coaching at the time that got you curious? Well, that's a really, actually, a really interesting thing, because I knew there was something, but I wasn't sure what it was. So, you know, I've, I'm an extrovert. I've always been really into people and a people watcher. I love to travel. And, you know, n- knowing people everywhere is is something that I really love doing. And so knowing it was about people was, I think, one thing. Um, I think also given the experience I'd had at Frito-Lay where I'd found myself adrift in a foreign country, which of course Texas really is, <laughs> and, and, and you know, with no one to talk with and no one that was shepherding me or helping me solve. And I think when I started to understand what coaching was, it struck me that if I'd had a coach just that, you know, that short time ago, that recently, I might have been able to figure out how to stay at that job that I loved. So wow. I think that was one piece of it. Um, It took me a few years to figure out that my career in marketing and advertising was all about human behavior and motivation. And lo and behold, so is coaching. But I didn't connect those dots for quite a while. Wow. (laughs) I love that. It's so true. (laughs) Finding that more and more, too, as that industry grows, I find. Mm -hmm. Um, Interesting. And then I also understand that you then started a company called Parachute Executive Mm -hmm. Coaching. I just want to get a background on that, too, of like what made you start the company? I come from a family of entrepreneurs and the one sort of guiding principle of do you start a thing just under your own name or do you start it under something else is do I want it to be bigger than me and do I want the option of selling it one day? Hmm. And from the beginning, I thought if I'm going to build something, I do want it to be bigger than me and I would like the option of selling it one day. And so I, so I called it something. Mm -hmm. Uh, But even that in the early days, the first four or five years, it really was just me. And wow. I credit an HR leader at a big telecom here in Canada with helping me create that next level of the business because I'd been doing some coaching work there, had had some success uh, with a couple of pretty big personalities, pretty tough customers. And uh, <laughs> this HR leader came to me and she said, we don't know what it is that you're doing that's different than the other coaches we have working here, but you're getting better results with tougher people. So mm. if you could if you could go find some coaches and teach them to coach the way you coach, we'd like to give you more business. Wow. Is that ever amazing? I know. <laughs> I know. Like a magical <laughs> moment for you. I know. I'm still in touch with that person. And I do credit her regularly with the existence of my business. Wow. So, because we've stayed, we've stayed good, good business colleagues ever since. <laughs> Incredible. I'm curious about, about that part. Like what was the secret to your coaching and, and is if you were to attribute it to something at this time, like what was, do you get any sense of what was kind of making you stand out and getting the, the more results from the tougher clients at the time? Well, that, that offer forced me to think about that. It forced me to really figure out what I was doing because I just knew that I was working with these business people, you know, trying to help them be better leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd had enough of a corporate career to know the difference between a good and a bad leader. Yeah. Um, and then by this point, I'd taken quite a bit of coach training. So Um, So when I did sort of pull myself back, I realized, uh, particularly in the early days of coaching, there was a lot of 
blurred territory between life coaching and executive coaching. Mm. And for me, I was rock solid on the executive side. I come from business. I've got a business career. I've got a business education. Uh, you know, so I was rock solid that we were in the business realm. Um, I understood the contracting and accountability with a company who was paying for the coaching and what they got and didn't get as a result of them writing the check for coaching, which is some good structure around engagement um, principles and confidentiality. Um, so, so it's being clear that we were about a business outcome, not that the whole person doesn't exist, of course they do, but, mm -hmm. but you know, understanding that accountability. Um, I really believe that an executive coach is best when they have a business education and have had an executive level career. Yeah. Because I think it's really hard to coach a senior level executive if you've never walked in their shoes. Mm. So, you know, Absolutely. I don't think industry experience is relevant, but certainly that, that understanding of the container that they're in. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious too, just as you're talking about it, what's been the biggest change that you've seen since you started in, in the coaching industry, especially in the executive side from then to now? When I first started executive coaching, if anybody knew about it was really seen as pretty remedial. Okay. And so the good news is now it's not only less seen as remedial, that does exist still, but it's much less so, but it's actually really understood more as an investment now. And, and almost like, a, well, well, if I'm going anywhere in this company, you should probably be getting me a coach because that'll help me. So right. I think the, the reason why behind executive coaching has definitely progressed. There are a lot of things about the coaching industry that have not moved as nearly as much as I would have wanted them to in the time that, that I've been in it. But at least that aspect of executive coaching has. I'm curious, what are some of the things you'd love to see different? Hey, um, <laughs> <laughs> again, how many conversations are you and I going to have? I know this could be <laughs> an ongoing a series. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, well, the, under, or the, the belief that you don't have to have training to be a coach. Coaching remains unregulated. I don't actually want it to be regulated, but I do want there to be a clearer understanding that there are distinct skills and that the more a coach has invested in learning those skills and getting good at those skills. And I know you're training, I know you're deep in this. Yeah. Um, so, so for me, the, the people who call themselves coaches who have never opened a coaching book, who've never taken a course, they do damage. Yes. You know, I, I mean, I, I've cleaned it up. I've cleaned it up a number of times. So mm -hmm. um, that for me continues to be a, a source of frustration. It, it continues to be something that I debate and, and challenge often in a lot of circles. Yeah, I'm, I, we're right on the same page with that one for sure. I, uh, I think it's encouraging, though, that it's becoming more of a known profession. And it seems like it's being more accepted in like larger circles, too. Mm -hmm. So agree. Yeah. That, Hopefully it's going in that direction. I, I really hope so. Cause I agree that it's, it's like jump. If you were to jump into an operating room without the credentials of being a doctor, like, <laughs> kind of similar, isn't it? It's yeah. <laughs> well, it's also the reason I'll pay money to have someone else do my taxes. <laughs> exactly. Because I don't, because I don't think that I should try and do that, even though technically I could probably do an okay job, but I might get myself in real trouble. Absolutely. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Speaking about doing it all. I mean, I, I've just been so inspired by your book. This oh, thank book you. Put out. It's called The Accidental Alpha Woman. I just love this title. And The Guide to Thriving When Life Feels Overwhelming. <laughs> it's incredible. What inspired you to write it? Oh, my gosh. Um, it's one of those things that was three months in the writing and 15 years in the making, I think, hmm. um, because it's rooted in my own personal story. And I found myself in a situation where I, I was suddenly in a life situation that it was not what I had envisioned, not what I'd planned, not what I'd signed up for. And it was overwhelming. And I was, I was angry a lot and frustrated. And uh, I love a good alliteration. And I, one day as I was trying to figure out what was going on, I came up with this idea of the accidental alpha. And uh, you know, I thought it was kind of fun and an interesting way to maybe talk about the situation that I was in. What I wasn't prepared for is that anytime I mentioned just that little phrase to another woman, 99 times out of 100, I would get a, aha, that's me. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. There was just this instant connection with this idea of the accidental alpha woman. That's incredible. For people that are listening that are unsure about what that means, how would you define the alpha woman? Well, so 
in the book, I talk about the difference between an accidental alpha and an intentional alpha. Uh, so I think everybody has some understanding of what alpha means, uh, you know, in terms of dogs, it's, you know, the lead one in the pack, that sort of thing. Yeah. I know quite a number of intentional alpha women who are strong and forthright and goal oriented and achieving big things and taking no prisoners and, um, <laughs> and feeling, and feeling great about it. And they're, they're, <laughs> clear about who they are in the world and they're crystal clear about what to say no to mm. and they will delegate comfortably they will hire comfortably and so those those women those are women I really admire and that was not what I felt like I was what the was accidental your... alpha yeah I want to hear <laughs> well, about I, that <laughs> I, yeah so I found myself I at the time so my coaching business was re relatively young as were my children and I all of a sudden found myself as the sole income in my house um, and this was a life that had been constructed based on two equal incomes. Hmm. So all of a sudden one went missing and it was all on my shoulders. And with wow. a very young coaching business, that was really, really hard. So, um, I, 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 again, I was, I was resentful a lot. Um, and, and, uh, and, and then trying to figure out, you know, was this normal, was this something I could solve? Was this something I was just going to have to tolerate and deal with, that kind of thing? Um, and, and it took me a while to figure out that there were probably things I knew professionally that maybe would be useful to me as I tried to figure this out. That took an astonishingly, embarrassingly long period of time. <laughs> so, so the accidental alpha, gets back to your question, the accidental alpha is a woman who it finds herself in this situation where she's juggling everything, all of the responsibilities, all of the roles, and it wasn't the plan. She wasn't set up for it. She wasn't, she hadn't agreed to it probably. She, she wasn't prepared for it and, and not very happy about it. And so for me, the real tension is in that, that disconnect between what I, what I thought my life was going to look like and what it's ended up being. Mm. I think so many of us feel that way at times where, you know, we've got this sort of vision about, yeah, the, the way life should be going for us. And then all of a sudden it just yeah. steers unexpectedly and we're, it drops in our exactly. lap. Yeah. Completely relatable. Yeah. You talk, you talk about the idea of a strong woman in your book as well. And I'd love for you to define that. Like, what does that mean to be a strong woman to you? I think what it can mean and what it's come to mean are different. Yeah. So I know a lot of women, including myself, who wear strong as a bit of a badge of honor and define it as I can handle it. Mm. I've got this. I don't need help. And I think the real strength and Brene Brown's work is totally based on all of this. The real strength is in knowing when and where to ask for help, being mm. willing to say, no, actually, I can't or not right now. That for me is real strength. That's character strength. Uh, but I do think that our, our default is um, you know, whether it's a, uh, I don't want to bother anybody or whether it's, I'm too ashamed to admit I can't handle the load or, I mean, there's any number of other ways that it, that it can arise. But, but I think that we've, we've created strong in a really unfortunate, dysfunctional, exhausting way. And I think it's time for that to change. Absolutely. You know, when I was reading through the, uh, the caption of your book, for some reason, I was thinking about the girl power, women power movement. And for me, like I was quite young at the time when I first started hearing this, I remember the Spice Girls mm -hmm. came out. I don't know if you remember that era, <laughs> Spice Girls, and it was all about girl power. And it's just so interesting. I, I'm curious, like, what, what do you see, like, in your opinion, what do you think kind of moved us in that direction of like, women power and this kind of strong woman mentality that we can do it all versus asking for help? How do we get there? I, well, there's a giant anthropological study that needs to be done behind that. But I think it's safe yeah. to say that as we discovered and earned more uh, professional opportunity, more workplace opportunity, we didn't let go of some of the other uh, responsibilities that we had more traditionally been carrying. Mm. And I think that in, in the typical sort of um, heterosexual couple kind of household, I think we forgot to bring the men along with us and say, okay, you know, since I'm now doing some of this, maybe we should split things a little bit. Right. Um, Agreed. So, <laughs> I don't, I, I know very few men who are unwilling to take it on. Um, most of the men I, I know say, but if you had just asked, 
right? So I think we didn't get very good at asking along mm. with, and I think women generally don't ask all that well in a lot of categories. I think we don't ask for what we really need and deserve at work either. Um, and so when it comes to asking for help of any variety, I think that's something that, that I know I personally could get a lot better at even now and I know better. Yeah, I love, you know, you're just reminding me of my, my current relationship with my wife and how so often like we'll get in these situations where she's working a full-time job nine to five and then she'll come home, she'll make dinner, she'll do the dishes, she'll clean up. And I like try to get in there and say, can I help? And oftentimes she's like, no, I've got it all figured out. And we've had a lot of conversations about this where, you know, if taking on the entire world can really be exhausting. Like it can burn you out and kind of moves you in this other trek. And so I, I have like a lot, this is a really close to home topic that you're bringing up for me right now, because we're, we're in discussion about that. And I'm curious from the coaching perspective, like how would you move somebody into the space of asking for help? Well, I'm going to get my wife to listen, by the way, <laughs> we should listen together. But. I think that all of us have to decide what things are really important for us to do and why, mm. because I personally would never hang my identity on whether or not I was the one that cleaned the dishes. Right. Um, and in fact, one woman I know I was speaking with, uh, and she's one of the ones that seems to have a, the load thing handled pretty well. She's much more in the intentional category. And she told me that she had gotten chastised by some of her female friends because she outsourced picking her kids up from school. Wow. And she said, that's just transportation. Right. She said, if I can get a half hour more work done so when they get home, I can be fully present, that's worth it to me. And that's just transportation. I'm okay with not being their transportation because I want to be their fully present mother when they get home. Wow. Yeah. Right? That's so that was, and yeah, that was right. That's awareness. And that was her example of, I don't need to do it all. I'm not going to try. I'm going to offload a couple of the things that I think in my world are perfectly fine. My kids will be okay if I'm not the one in the car picking them up. Wow. Incredible. That takes a lot of strength and, and think, courage to do that. Well, I mean, I think, I think other women are oftentimes the worst critics, or at least we think they might be maybe they're not actually saying the things out loud. Maybe they are, I don't know. Um, but I do think to take a good look at what things are important to me and why, and be willing to then say, okay, now how can I get some help on some of the other things? One of the best things I ever did when my kids were young was get my groceries delivered. Mm -hmm. It was just like, oh, and other people are, are saying to me things like, well, you're letting someone else choose your, your tomatoes? I said, yeah, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. And all the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, it's as you're talking and you mentioned it a little bit earlier, like sometimes it can come with a bit of a shame or guilt feeling when we ask for help. Like somehow we don't have it all figured out and there's kind of this pressure to be seen and show up a certain way. So how do you ask for help? and ditch the shame, like to get over that. Any, any suggestions That's on that? That's the thing please? that takes real courage. It does, it takes real courage. And mm. to be okay with not making everybody happy, um, to stand firm on something that, you're, that you believe in that's aligned with your values and not listen to what other people say. I do think that we get really caught up in what other people say and what other people think and, or, or what we think they're going to say. Like I said, yes. it's, it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't even come out loud. Yeah. Um, but I think getting clear on your own personal set of values, your own wiring, and then creating a plan that aligns with all of that, that's how you look at yourself in the mirror at the end of every day and say, no, you know what? I think, I think I'm on the right track here. I think I'm doing the things that I believe in. Mm. And they're not other people's things. Like nobody's set of, here's what I believe in is exactly the same as somebody else's. So I think it's futile to try and match ourselves up against other people's standards just hearing you say that feels so empowering you know we spend so much time worrying about everybody else's opinion and so we kind of shy away from what our heart really wants I, I find that too and it's like how do you build up that kind of muscle where you can go for it anyway do it anyway versus oh, I'm not good. I'm going to play small because I don't want to make anyone feel insecure or uncomfortable or be judged wow right. very, really inspiring um, another thing that's coming up for me as we're talking about it is just also 
you know, you and I are coaches, so we spend a lot of time talking about people's values and how to find out what's important. But I imagine there's people listening right now that are like, where would I even begin to know what is most important to me? What kind of direction would you steer them in to start them on that path? Well, rather than steer them toward the 10,000 coaching books that are out there. Um, <laughs> right. For, for me, the, simple, the simplest exercise is to sit down and think about major decisions that you've ever made in your life mm. and why you made a decision one way or another and to reflect back on which decisions you were happy with and which ones you weren't. Because chances are the ones that you're still comfortable with after the fact are ones that you made in alignment with your values. Whereas ones that you caused you anxiety or discomfort after the fact, or that you really were torn when you were trying to make them, those were probably not aligned with your values. Wow. I love it. This kind of reminds me of what you talk about in the book around the real you, finding the real you in your work. And I'm just curious, mm -hmm. like what this means and how do we connect and how do we know if it's the real us versus who we think we should be? One of my first coaches used to talk a lot about the struggle-free life. And I've been having a lot of conversations about this with my 22-year-old son right now, who's just graduated and trying to find the right path, the career path, the right work. And I just, you know, I, I'm still coaching as many years after I started because it doesn't feel like work. And if it ever does feel like work, and I think you have this similar experience, if I'm not mistaken, if it ever does feel like work, I'm working with the wrong people. I'm trying to do the, something that's at odds with, with my natural wisdom, with my natural abilities. Mm. So I think paying attention, and this is, you know, in the book, I talk about the different ways women can learn to receive, receiving the messages, receiving the intuitive messages that say, this, this feels good, this feels right, this, this seems to make sense. Might not make sense to anybody else, but that's okay. I mean, you know, when I, when I decided to be a coach, something about it just called to me and I followed and nobody knew what a coach was back then nobody had ever heard of it and yet I was absolutely sure there was something about this that appealed to me that was interesting to me that was that was worth trying to figure out so I think the more attuned you can get and this is where mindfulness practice is a huge asset right yeah. the more attuned you can get to to what's going on for you when you're quiet the more likely you are to be able to make those values-based decisions in a way that I was going to honor what you're really all about. Oh, amazing. How, how have you found this integrating into the like executive space these days around trusting intuition, getting in touch with what we really need or want as we're making decisions? How does this play into the sort of the corporate sector of things? It uh, really depends on the leader. I think a really good leader understands that most of the decisions they make are some combination of art and science, uh, some yeah. combination of data and gut. Right. You know, and I used to work with the CEO of quite a large company and he would say, they'll give me all the data and then I'll just sit with it for a minute. Mm. Right. And if there's, you know, if there's something that I don't know or something that I'm not sure about, or if, you know, if I just sit with it for a minute, it'll come. Mm. And That's, so to be willing to give yourself that space. Right? Yes. Yeah. I was just going to say that space between feels so important. Do you find that challenge? I mean, we're in a culture right now that's just so fast paced, it seems, where there's just mm -hmm. so much coming in. How do we carve out the time to even do that? Uh, you know, it doesn't just happen, right? Right. So when I'm working with an executive level client who, who's never been, who's never enjoyed the benefit of any sort of reflective practice, I just get them to start small. You know, I run corporate mindfulness programs and, and I'll get them to just start with two minutes a day. Just take two minutes when you sit up in the morning before your feet hit the floor, take two minutes and just deep breathe and just let the thoughts flow and then see what happens. You know, nine times out of 10, they like it and they increase it. But I don't, I don't preach about a, a prescribed way of doing a thing. I just want them to take a few minutes and get quiet. And if the meeting with me is the only time they're quiet, in their week, then we'll start the session with a couple of minutes of mindfulness practice. Wow, powerful, powerful. I, I just, I need them, I need them settled. I need them not, you know, bouncing between the screens and I just, I just need them to just be present. Yeah, it I mean, you and I both know it, it takes a lot to show up in the space of being a coach, especially, 
when you're sometimes walking into situations where you've got someone that the last thing they want to do is sit down in a conversation about how am I being right now? You know, they're like, let's just get on with it. How do we, I just want to do this, you know? Um, right. What do you mean being? Being like, take a breath. I don't have time to take a breath. <laughs> you know, I think so many of us, whether we're executives or not, like there's this sort of feeling of, I don't want to slow down and feel my feelings. I just want to get to wherever I'm supposed to be going. Mm-hmm. In those moments, how do you, how do you really help somebody realize the benefits of this and to kind of buy into the process, so to speak? Well, the first thing I'll do is, is never claim like I've got it all figured out Yeah. because you know, there's a reason we call it a practice, right? Right. It's, we're never done. Um, usually <laughs> yeah. I'll get them to try an experiment. I won't ask them to make a big commitment. I'll usually ask them to try an experiment. Give me five minutes a day for a week and then talk to me. You know, see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's take go for a walk without your phone. You know, it might be as simple as that. Just sure. leave the phone behind and just see. So, you know, I usually look for a really small access point, a thin edge of the wedge in, and an agreement to just just try and experiment. Yeah, I love the idea of experimenting versus like there's a right or wrong way as well because it leaves it open to the for the client right. to find out what works or what didn't work. So there's something. Yes, exactly. I, love, oh, I just love geeking out on coaching, Karen. <laughs> this is like one of my passions too. So, so do I. <laughs> oh, it's so much fun. Yeah, cool. Um, just back to the, uh, the part about uh, the alpha woman again. I just, I really want to highlight this book because I know there's a lot of women that are tuning in because I'm guessing that just triggered them into this space. They're like, I feel like I've got the world going on and I, I got to slow down. And you talk in your book about there being a framework, so to speak. I, mm-hmm. I, I don't want to spoil the book because I really want people to go read it. But if you could just kind of point us in the direction of that framework, it's kind of the, is there kind of a gist to it that you could let us in on about, yeah, how to transition out of trying to do it all ourselves? The, the framework is based on a moment in, at an event, and I, and I tell this story in the book a little moment where I was at this entrepreneurial immersion and this one young woman business owner was talking about all of the big changes she intended to make in her business and how they were, she was just going to, you know, conquer the world with what she was up to. Mm -hmm. And as she went on and on and on about all of the things she planned, there were 20 of us in the room around her and everybody was chipping in with ideas and offers and contributions and partnerships and all sorts of things. And she was just, she was lost in her own to-do list. And finally, one of the facilitators stood up and almost had to yell, you suck at receiving. Oh, wow. (laughs) Wow. And and that was, it was funny because I shared that story with one of the other women who was at the retreat um, just recently. And I said, yeah, I was telling the story from that that time we were in that, in that, uh, at that offsite. And she said, oh, was that me? I said, no, it wasn't you. And she said, well, it could have been. Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) And several of the other women who were in that group at the time, as I've said, I'm telling this story from that event, a couple of them have said, um, was it no, and it, you know, thinking that it might have been them in the hot seat when, when that, you know, you suck at receiving moment came about. Um, I just, I think that, that as we take on more and to try to accomplish more, um, I, I just think the idea of accepting help accepting support, accepting ourselves, and that maybe we can't or shouldn't try to do it all. Um, I think that acceptance is, is fundamental. And so I built a little framework around the idea of allowing opportunities and resources and, um, and acceptance into our lives in a way that uh, is, is our choice and is on the basis of what's important to us and who we really are and without apology for not being able to handle it all. Wow. I love it. I love this. I, you know, I, it's interesting. Um, I'm in an interesting situation these days. There's, I find when groups of women come together, sometimes there can be this unspoken sort of stuff that happens on the real emotional side of things where, it's not said out loud, but it's just kind of assumed or felt. I don't know if you know what I'm pointing at, but I just find like when there's sometimes it seems like when groups of women come together, it's 
it's like it's not spoken but it's sort of um emotionally felt that you're there's rules about what you should and shouldn't do as a woman and just curious how women could support women in this step towards asking for help and you know going after what their heart's desire is versus what they think they should be doing on some sort of the supportive it's, side of it the, the good news is it's very dependent on the group of women and okay. i think it's incumbent on all of us to be more discerning about who we hang around with and uh -huh. who we allow into our space i mean i've had people um, get really curious about why I'm still on Facebook and why I seem to like being on Facebook. And I like to say, well, it's because I've scrubbed my feet. I've scrubbed it clean. There are, there are no nasty people in there. There are no people who will point out the bad for, before the good. You know, I'm, my Facebook feed's filled with puppies. Um, oh. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that, and I think social media is, is one area, but, but real life, also, I think we, if we just are a little more discerning about who we allow in, it is okay to divorce friends. It is okay to choose to not spend time with people if they don't bring us joy or nurture us or, or somehow enhance our, our feelings about ourselves and our lives. So, but, and, and I think that's something that is not done enough is that mm -hmm. discernment about, no, I actually choose not to spend time with you. I, I wish you no ill will please go and be happy, but I just don't need to spend time with you. Oh, love that. I'm also thinking about the power of just being able to say no in our culture where it's like, so often we're so, we feel this sort of obligation that we have to say yes. So that's just coming up as you're naming that too. Any, any comments? Uh, I on read the... something the other day. Yeah. No, is a complete sentence. Right. No, is a complete <laughs> sentence. Exactly. Whew. That it hits right to the heart. I'm such a yes person. So to be able to say no and not feel guilty or shameful if it's the truth is like such a powerful practice. So, hmm. yeah, but you know, it's the thing about we train other people how to, how to treat us by how we treat ourselves. And if we're always saying yes to other people, then we're loading ourselves up and we're depleting our own gas tank. We're not, we're not saving any energy for, for what's important to us. I love that. I had a friend once say, Keith, your yes means nothing if you can't say no as well. Kind of Oh, I like that. Yeah, I liked it too. Liked <laughs> At the that. time, I didn't yeah. like it. <laughs> I was saying yes to everything. But um, yeah. it puts some real That would value. be hard to listen to, but yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah, cool. I, speaking about yeses and nos and just um, really getting rooted in our own like confident decision making, like right now at the time in the world we're in as we're recording this we're in the pandemic and we're, it's just all the patterns seem to be all over the map right now and mm -hmm. just from the coaching perspective what what's it been like to coach during the pandemic for you oh well the the odd thing to say is that uh, we at my company have been busier than ever like ridiculously busy and and i think I'm happy that the leaders who are reaching out to us are doing that because they need support. I'm, I'm happy that they know that we are a form of support that can be really, really useful. So, but it does feel a bit odd to say my business is thriving these days. So, you know, that, with that, with that caveat, I have said from almost the beginning that leader burnout is the thing that's going to happen that is not necessarily being planned for and expected. Because the higher up the leader is, the more people they have that they're responsible for and the more weight of the business they're shouldering. Plus, they've got their own family concerns. And so they've got kids at home. They've got aging parents. They can't travel to see important family members. And they're worried about their teams. And in some cases, I've got clients who run um, like sort of field operations kind of distribution center based things. And they've got disease hotspots and they've had to make choices about the business that are really, really difficult. I've got... Um, clients whose businesses have had to accelerate whatever they do because of the nature of the business they're in, pharmaceuticals or necessary retail or um, healthcare, that sort of thing. So the, the pressures are just are, are um, unprecedented, yeah. if for lack of a better word. And, and the people that we work with are really committed and really want to deliver whatever it is it's their role to deliver in the best way possible. And they've been working almost around the clock for now, what, eight, nine months. Yeah. Um, 
At one point, an HR leader friend of mine went around to all of the leaders in the organization that she supports and she mandated vacation. Wow. Yeah, like she basically said, we will be turning off your technology for two weeks. Wow. Unless you book yourself out of the office and, and actually take a real break. And I don't care that you can't go anywhere. You need to be switched off because yes. we're worried about you. So powerful and important right now. Yeah. Yeah. So important, you know, yeah. but, but, you know, that's a really common thing. Well, I don't have anywhere to go. Why would I take vacation or things are really hard right now? Why I can't take vacation, but it's not about taking vacation in the Caribbean Island sense. It's about giving yourself some distance from the pressure to try and replenish, to try and, and build your resilience back up. Wow. Yeah. It's uh, I, over here. I've been very similar experience with uh, the coaching clients I'm working with where it just seems like the pressure is mounting and I, the leader burnout prediction is pretty accurate. I'd agree yeah. just to try to uh, make sure that we're regulating and, and self-caring through all of this. It's so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Wow. Agreed. Huh. I'm, uh, I'm just curious, like this, this was a question that came to me as I was reading through your, your book and your info. Um, if you could give advice to your younger self who was trying to do it all at the time, what would you tell her now? Well, to some degree, that's the book. <laughs> yeah. um, well, you know, as a coach, I don't give advice, right? True. <laughs> <laughs> Is that like a little <laughs> steer away from my question? <laughs> uh, no, no, not at all. No, it's a good question, though, because I think that... Um, I think that I spent an awful lot of my younger years, um, I think trying to fit into other people's ideas of what was good and what was successful and what was right. And yeah, I think I, think I was um, startlingly far into adulthood before I started to really listen to my own voices in a meaningful way. So um, yeah, I think to not be afraid of following a different path or being a little bit different, the weirdos will inherit the earth, right? <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> I love that. And yet, just to, like seeing your story and how it's unfolded, I mean, I just am appreciating that part of you that jumped in and took the risk to start this coaching business early on. I mean, that took so much courage at the time, I imagine. It's incredible. You know, it didn't, that's the interesting thing. It really didn't feel like it. Really? It really didn't. I mean, I was, I was, unbelievably well equipped to start a business in a new space because my whole marketing career had been based on launching new products into new categories. Right. And so I knew how to position something. I knew how to talk to the media. I knew how to make a presentation I, you know, so there was an awful lot that I was equipped for uniquely in the coaching space versus a lot of the other folks that were coming into it. Yeah. And with that, I think came an ability to talk about it. And in the first couple of conversations I had, where I just sort of took a leap and thought, well, I'm just going to say this and see what happens. I got good responses. So I had some encouragement, some positive reinforcement quite early, and that really helped. Mm. Wow, it's amazing. It's also, I'm just thinking when you are set on a path that comes from a place of intuition or you're paying attention, do you find, I, I find it just seems easier to make that leap into whatever it is you're doing when it's, it's, it's going to happen anyway. So <laughs> it's, a, it's, yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, uh, there have been quite a number of decisions I've made in my life that to the outside might look a little on the crazy side, but I don't know if they feel right. I tend to just do it. That's, I love it. <laughs> That's a way to live. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> there's probably the some downside. <laughs> Sounds like there's some edge at times when you, when you're doing that. <laughs> I'm curious too, just in terms of people, future people that are going to read this book, um, especially people that are listening right now to our conversation and they're intrigued by the book. What are you hoping that they will take away after reading this book? That doing it alone is doing it the hard way. And that there's nothing to be ashamed of in saying no or not now, or could you help me? I mean, it's really that simple. I just, I, I think we overcomplicate ourselves a lot. <laughs> and so I just, uh, I think if, if more women in particular, people in general, but women in particular, would be more able and willing to say, I could use some help. 
you know, I think, yeah. I think life would be easier. I love it. I'm just curious to uh, your hope to see the future of coaching evolving. What's your, um, what do you hope to see in terms of the, the future of where our coaching industry goes these days? Oh my gosh. How long have you got? Um, (laughs) I want more coaches choosing to come into this line of work, to come into it with the understanding that it is equal parts coaching skill and business skill. Yes. That you don't get to make a difference in the world if you can't pay your bills. And so to accept that there will be selling involved, there will, and we can debate what selling looks like in coaching, but, but, but there are absolutely nuts and bolts kind of business skills required. Um, Too many people are still coming into coaching without a real acceptance that you have to know how to run a business in order to survive. Yeah, So That would be thing one. Um, Thing two, I would love all of the fly-by-night coach certifications to go away. So there were a finite number of really high quality programs with degrees of financial accessibility um, because uh, I think that the more people who are well-trained as coaches, the better the world is. I love that. And I would like more coaches to be more generous with each other. I think one of the problems with coaching is with so many people in it who don't really know how to run a business, who don't know how to create a sustainable system for themselves, there's, there's unnecessary competition and dysfunction. And I want that to go away because really we are, there's enough business for everyone. um, And, and we are, part of what can help make the world a better place. I fundamentally believe that. So it would be nice if we were all coming from that place of abundance. Karen, I love this vision. <laughs> we're in alignment. <laughs> it's very encouraging to, uh, to know that you're here on the planet and parachute coaching oh. is, is happening. It's, oh, it's inspiring. Um, I, I want to in, invite people to go check out the website, accidentalalpha.com as well to get more information on your book and uh, your services. And I just, I'm trusting that this is landing perfectly on time for people today as you're listening in. And I just really want to encourage you to, to stay in touch with Karen and her work. You're uh, you're an inspiration for many people. I'm inspired oh, to stay, connect with you here. So thanks for, for joining me today on the podcast. Oh, it's been a pleasure. It's been really fun. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. All right, well, that concludes another episode of Let's Connect, and I hope that it's inspired you as much as it has me. Thank you so much for tuning in, and remember to subscribe to both the YouTube channel and the podcast channel, and I look forward to you joining me on the next episode of Let's Connect.